you are important. You belong. You have a destiny and a future. World Impact Celebration Church Online is a spiritual family of believers from all over the world where you can discover your purpose and grow in the grace of Jesus Christ. You will hear teachings by Dr. Peter Youngren, Pastor Nathan Thurber, and others. You will participate in worship, prayer, and taking the Lord's communion every week. You will enjoy video testimonies and interviews from around the world. No matter where you live, your prayer request will be included in every service. This will truly be an international online church. Wherever you live, from Southeast Asia to Europe, North and South America, Africa, and Australia, this can be your spiritual home. All over the world, I meet people who ask me if there's a way that they can participate in the services from the Toronto Celebration Church. Well, we're offering something much more than just a streaming service. This is a full-fledged online church for you. The World Impact Celebration Church Online is a place where you can find a spiritual family, a place of belonging, and where you can grow in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Set your calendar for 10.30 a.m. New York time. That's 4.30 p.m. Central European time and 10.30 p.m. for most countries in Southeast Asia. Heaven will include people of every culture, nationality, and ethnicity, and this will be a foretaste of heaven. World Impact Celebration Church Online is a place where you belong, where you will be nurtured, and where you can find your destiny. Welcome to Power Hour. We're excited that you've joined us this evening and we have an uh, amazing teaching lined up from Pastor Peter Youngren. He'll be teaching on the gospel and Eastern religion. You're going to want to hear what he has to say. Uh, uh, he's spoken to thousands upon thousands of people in just such a setting, people who adhere to an Eastern religion and have seen many of them uh, receive Jesus as Savior, receive Jesus as healer. And so he has some profound thoughts to share. And so share, share this teaching with others. Uh, it's on Facebook, it's on YouTube. Share it with friends so that others can hear this uh, uh, profound uh, word that will shape the gospel work that uh, uh, your life, your church, your ministry does. And so uh, this is a powerful teaching tonight. So we're honored that you've joined us. Toronto Celebration Church, World Impact Celebration Church. We're pulling both, both churches together tonight for this powerful teaching. So thank you. Sit back, relax, get, take, get at your pen and note paper ready. Uh, as soon as, once Pastor Peter's done, I'll be back. A few exciting developments happening in our uh, church family. We'll have a time of prayer. Send your prayer requests. We have prayer Wednesdays, uh, uh, Mondays, Sundays, and of course we pray every day for your prayer need. We're believing God for your life and so we're a spiritual family. We're honored that you've joined it. So let's go ahead to the teaching now with Pastor Peter Youngred. Welcome to lesson 12. I'm talking about the gospel and Eastern religions. Now in the, in the Eastern religions we include, there's a number of different religions, Hinduism, Buddhism, there is another religion called Jainism, which is very similar to uh, Hinduism, but there are differences. Uh, you will see that the Jains are even more careful not to hurt any life. Uh, some Jains will be seen walking down the street, sweeping with a broom before they step down, lest they inadvertently would step on a mosquito or a worm or some living thing. They want to preserve life. You have Sikhism. Uh, I'm not even pretending to be able to teach all these religions. I will make a few comments about Hinduism and Buddhism. That's all. I recommend if you want to study further, there's much material available. And you can see some of the recommended readings in this uh, module two. Uh, they are listed there and I won't go over them. And I do have some books here I will show you. But first, let me just say my own experience. Uh, within Hinduism, uh, India has been a very much a part of my experience. In India, uh, the, the main religion is Hinduism. In uh, Nepal, Hinduism uh, was for many years the state religion. And up till about 25 years ago, there was hardly any Christians in the nation of Nepal. Virtually everyone was a Hindu. 
in one part of Indonesia, the province of Bali, which is very famous for tourists, uh, Hinduism is the main religion. Approximately 95% of the people practice Hinduism. I have spent considerable time there. We've had four uh, gospel campaigns in the national stadium in Bali and seen tremendous results. And of course, then we come across Hindus in many other parts of the world, such as in Myanmar, such as in Africa. Uh, you have uh, often communities from India that have immigrated to Africa, and so we come across Hindu temples in, in many parts of the world. And uh, what I've discovered, in, first in India and then in these other countries, is that uh, Hindus, of course, are very receptive uh, to the gospel. Now, within Hinduism, you have many deities, many gods. Virtually anything can be called a god. Um, and so, in that sense, to add Jesus Christ to the pantheon of gods, he's just another god among the gods, um, that is quite easily done for a Hindu person, but to, to preach the uniqueness of Jesus Christ, and then to see that message confirmed in a miraculous way is, is the key uh, to really make inroads in the Hindu community. Now, uh, and so I can think of, of astounding miracles I've seen. I have, in one of my first visits to India, I met with then Prime Minister Indira Gandhi, prayed with her. I've had open doors to governmental leaders within Hinduism, just as I have in uh, with many Muslim leaders, presidents, prime ministers, members of parliaments, governors that are Muslim. And, but but uh, with Hindus, the same open door, the same openness. And then with Buddhist, we have been exposed to Buddhism in Sri Lanka and in uh, Myanmar and in Mongolia. In fact, when I was in Mongolia, it was a few years after communism had left. And in fact, the same week I was there, the Dalai Lama, who uh, is considered the, he's considered either a, a king or a god to Buddhist. He was there visiting and he held his meetings parallel with mine and, and the newspapers and the television of course, um, broadcast the news about both of them. And I can say that in Mongolia at that time, the newspapers broadcast that uh, the young and the middle aged were in our meeting and the older people were, were listening to the Dalai Lama. And they also commented that uh, some of his uh, uh, people were falling asleep, but they were very much alive in our services and it actually caused the, the Dalai Lama to be very upset. He had a press conference in which he commented on our, on our gospel festival, warning for these foreign religions that were coming in on what was, in his words, uh, Buddhist lands. And I think he was uh, quite shocked when he saw our advertising all over the city. So the very nice uh, Dalai Lama that everybody considers such a gentle, sweet person, uh, he got a little bit upset with us in uh, Ulaanbaatar, the capital of, uh, of uh, Mongolia. So I've had some experience. I've met with uh, uh, what you call holy men uh, within Hinduism and Buddhism. I've sat down with leaders from the monasteries. I remember in, in Myanmar, I had uh, dinner with uh, uh, one very exalted religious leader who uh, supervises 1,200 pagodas. And a pagoda, let me explain to you, this is a very beautiful building, often with a golden roof in enormous architecture. These are, 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 would not be, uh, they would be considered large buildings anywhere. If they were in New York City, they would be considered a large building. And, uh, and so we have met with many of them, talked to them, and uh, I know how they approach things. When they see me uh, move in supernatural realities through Jesus Christ, seeing the sick healed, they believe intuitively that it's because of some meditation or some uh, inward concentration that is taking me years of training of inward focus and concentration on developing my mind to be able to do this. They always sit down and ask me. I, I remember in the, the city of Allahabad in India, I met a, a famous guru there that had a large, large compound with the disciples coming from everywhere. And he was very eager to know what uh, concentration powers I was using to be able to get the results I was getting. Uh, this is their assumption. And so I, of course, answer this very truthfully and say this is uh, 
the reality of Jesus Christ. I'm merely a representative of Jesus Christ. I'm invoking Jesus Christ. And they find that hard to grasp. They find that hard to relate to. Um, and, and, and they go back again, and I have to answer the same way again, uh, because they do believe that some humans reach a state of deification or near deity. And so uh, in India, it's very typical in, in that kind of culture that when people are healed, then the people fall down and, and want to kiss your foot and, and, and hold your foot. And, Many, many, many times I have to lift people up and I, I, I make a big scene of it in the sense that if they do it on the platform, so people uh, fall down and, and, and want to touch my foot because I was there and prayed for them and they were healed. Uh, I don't scold them for it. I merely lift them up and then I make it a teaching moment and say to the people, this person here is very grateful because uh, uh, their child was uh, blind and now can see and we can understand their gratitude but their gratitude is misdirected and then I begin to explain how we should be directed towards the Lord Jesus Christ and so that's how we work with Hindus and Buddhists. Now there are some very interesting things to learn here and again I'm going to give you hold up some books and there are many in the recommended re reading uh, at, at, in this module but uh, I'm not saying you should read that I'm just saying that I think with what I'm sharing during this, uh, these minutes together will help you. So let's look at Hinduism. I'm just reading from some of your notes there. This is the world's third largest religion. It involves sacrifices, rituals, prayers, and annual festival, festivals devoted to millions of different deities. There are some main deities, and uh, I'm not going to ever go into those, Shiva, Brahma, Rama, different ones. Uh, but just like Buddhism, Hinduism is a pantheistic religion. That would be an important word to know, pantheism. You know what theism is, uh, has to do with God? Pantheism is simply the belief that everything is God and God is everything. So, so uh, this, this, this chair is God. God is th this chair and everything is God. So you can pray to a rock, you can pray to a tree, you can pray to a person because pantheism means that God permeates everything. Now, in fact, before we just throw that thought out the window and say, well, that's ridiculous. Of course, we've already studied in module one about Christ, that he upholds all things, that in him all things consist. We studied a couple of lessons ago from Acts 17, where Paul says to the Athenian people that in Christ we live and move and have our being. So it's not that we're so far apart. The difference between Hinduism and the gospel here is that uh, we believe all things are upheld by God. Not that all things are God, but all things are upheld by God. And we also believe that God transcends all things. He's not confined, he transcends all things. So, uh, but you can say uh, to a Hindu person, I know that you believe God is in everything. And you know, the Bible says that in, in Christ, all things consist, but he's greater than all things. He conquered all things, he conquered death. And so you take it, you start with what they know and you take them further. Now, uh, then I, I put on your notes here, hang on to this. Many don't know this. The concept of prajapati sacrifice in Hinduism. Prajapati is a Hindu term which means the supreme God, the Lord of the universe, the God of all creation. Hinduism's oldest scriptures, the ancient Vedas, Vedas, that is the, 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 the book of, of, of Hindus, the most ancient scripture. The other scriptures, the Bhagavad Gita, etc., but the Veda book are the oldest. Well, uh, Prajapati is the supreme God, the Lord of the universe. Now, the Vedas were written between 1200 to 2000 before Christ, we believe, and the idea in the Vedas that is again and again repeated is the focus is on a sacrifice, sacrifice very much like a book of Leviticus. So you can, you can really take the, script, the biblical word sacrifice and relate that into the Hindu culture. And, and according to the ancient Vedas, a proper sacrifice carried out on earth is a symbolic 
representation of the sacrifice of God in heaven. Because a Prajapati, God, the Supreme One, according to the ancient Veda books, sacrificed himself. Wow. It's in Hinduism that the great supreme being sacrificed himself for others. Now, it's not exactly like it is in the Bible. It's not exactly like, like, you know, God coming in the person of Jesus. But you do have a parallel. And what I'm doing here, I'm just saying, let's, let's not, let's try to find common denominators. Let's take people from what is known to what they don't know. So you can say, you are familiar with the Prajapati sacrifice that God himself sacrificed himself. Well, that's what happened when God became man through Jesus Christ and offered himself for the sins of the world. Then you have the concept of Purusa Prajapati. I better write these words down. Purusa Purusa, uh, Prajapati. Prajapati. These are strange words to you unless you come from India. Purusa Prajapati. Well, a Purusa means man or cosmic being. And the ancient Vedas teach that Purusa, man, uh, and, and the Prajapati, God, are one. Think about this. And the idea is that Purusa being God and the source of all uh, because all things consist in Purusa. You see, it's a picture of Christ. And so it's a parallel to the Bible's teaching that Jesus Christ is the Alpha and the Omega. So it's not so hard to introduce his name is Jesus Christ. Now, according to the ancient Vedas, the Purusa sacrifice was the source of the creation of the world. That, that, that's how the world came to being. Now think about that. Revelation 13, 8. It says that Jesus is the Lamb of God who was slain before the foundation of the world. Now, I'm not saying these are identical. I'm saying you have points of contact here. It says also that Purusa, who is to me a picture of Christ, was the firstborn. But Christ is the firstborn of many brethren. It says that he is a mystery that's been hidden through the ages. They are pictures of Jesus Christ. So my point here is, And I put it in bold letters. Here is the primary key to present the gospel among Hindus. The concept of sacrifice goes like a thread throughout all of the Hindu religion. And it connects with the reality that Christ is the sacrifice for the sins of the world. So you can preach that Christ died for our sins. Christ was sacrificed for our sins. This is not a strange or a weird concept. This is a concept Hindus can relate to. You know, uh, I've been on by the river Ganges, uh, and I've seen the goats that are set apart for sacrifice. I, I've seen the rituals that Hindus go through because they're trying to deal with sin. They're trying to rid themselves of sin by various deeds, various actions. I remember I met one guru at the river Ganges who for 33 years had not cut his hair. Needless to say, his hair was several meters long, and it was quite a thing for him to even move around. He had to wrap it in a big red turban. It was huge, and it was very cumbersome. I asked him, why why don't you cut your hair? The obvious question. Everybody else seemed to be scared of this guru. He looked so different. I said, why didn't you cut your hair? And he looked at me, and he's saying, uh, so he wasn't going to answer, so I said, are you concerned about your sins? And he went, yeah, yeah. He nodded his head. I said, you feel guilty over your sin? Yeah. And do you think this act of not cutting your hair, this, this is helping you? Yes, yes. And then I told him about Jesus Christ. You see, it's a universal struggle. And, and so this idea of that Christ is a sacrifice, uh, teach that. Hinduism teaches four paths to God. Uh, one, one path is through knowledge. Not just factual information. Uh, it's in studying the, the Vedas and the Bhagavad Gita and other, other Hindu scriptures. But it's an intuitive knowledge. You get like a, the Buddhists call it enlightenment. And, and that word is not so much used in Hinduism, but it's, a, it's an intuitive knowledge. And I, and I put a question in your notes, how does that relate to the gospel? 
Well, we have something called revelation knowledge. Revelation knowledge. Um, and, and, and what do we mean by that? Revelation knowledge means that that which is in the scripture uh, about God, it becomes revelation knowledge to you. I could say it very simply, you know, God so loved the world. That's knowledge, but it becomes a revelation. God loved me. He loves everyone. It becomes a, a living revelation in you, revelation knowledge. So within Hinduism, one of the ways to get closer to God, to get closer to nirvana, we'll talk about what nirvana is in a moment, which is, people say heaven is not exactly like heaven, but, but it's, it's, yeah, for, for the time being, we can leave it there. Revelation knowledge is, is it, you can relate to that. That it, it, it's not just knowing factually, it's not just academic, academic knowledge, but it's having a revelation of Jesus Christ. You can talk to Hindus about that. Through love, that they get closer to God through love. This involves unselfish love for God without ulterior motive, love for love's sake alone. Worship and prayer is involved in expressing this love. Jainism, which I mentioned, which is a separate religion, but very closely related, at least through my eyes as a foreigner to Hinduism, it, it expresses this by not harming any, anything. And, and of course, people who try to get to God this way, they always find themselves coming up short. They find themselves lacking. And how beautiful there to introduce the gospel, especially First John chapter four, that we love because God first loved us. And teach first to receive God's love. First to receive, you have all this teaching in module one, you receive God's love and then you're able to share it with others. One of the ways that a Hindu believes they get closer to God is through work. Work is the staple of human life. Coming to God through work is a concept that all work is done to honor God. Each task becomes holy and should be approached as a duty to God that deserves one's full attention. So that, that's another merit. If you, if you work that way, then you get closer, your karma improves and you will be at least reincarnated into a better life in the future. I'll talk about reincarnation in a moment. Well, you know, uh, for us as believers, I teach about this often, that we, we don't in our daily work is, our, is one way that we express worship to God. We don't work as pleasers of men, as men servants, as eye servants, just when, when your boss is watching, but we're working uh, for the betterment of the organization, the corporation, the workplace we are in, because we see that work is unto the Lord. That's why you've heard of something called a Christian work ethic and Protestant work ethic, because when the Reformation came, 500 years ago in Germany, there was an emphasis and in, in, in Switzerland and France and these countries, uh, some of the reformers really emphasized that, that all that we do, whatever it is, if it's cleaning the floor, if whatever it is, uh, we're painting the house, whatever it is, it's a work done to our very best because it honors God. So it, it, they're, they're points of connection. Then uh, through psychophysical exercises, in other words, to exercising your body, yoga is one form, uh, but also through the mind and the subconscious, exercising through concentration, transcendental meditation, transcendental, transcend, uh, transcendental meditation, excuse me, uh, is an outgrowth of this. And, 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 you know, to focus your mind, to exercise your mind. I had a dear friend, she has passed away now. She was uh, closely associated with Maharishi Yogi. Some of you may not say, who's Maharishi Yoga? He's a person in the 1970s and 80s who introduced uh, transcendental meditation, short TM, and various forms of yoga into the Western world. And she became a disciple of his. And Elsa, her, her name, she, uh, I was in her home. She showed me her albums where she had pictures of the Beatles and Richard Gere and Mia Farrow and various stars from Hollywood that had been at the ashram studying at the feet of Maharishi Yogi at the same time that she was there. And, and she would say that, that she would say to Maharishi, I want to know God. I want to know God. And he would say, you need to meditate for 15 days. And she would go to a little cave 
that was there on the compound, and she would meditate for 15 days, meditate. And she said she had some spiritual experiences, maybe it was experiences of the mind, I can't, but she had some kind of, saw some visions, but she said, and I could even see that, that God was like a light, but there was, a, there was like a wall, it was a glass wall, but it was a wall between me and God, and there was God, but I couldn't reach him. He was there. And so she'll come back from her meditation, and she would say to Maharishi Yogi, well, she said, it was good, but I, I didn't get to know God. I didn't get to know God. And he said, well, you need to concentrate more to do more physical and mental and emotional and mind exercises. So after some days off, she would do another 15-day stint in the meditation cave. And others, like members of the Beatles, were doing it. She was telling me which one of the Beatles were most devoted than the others, and she was telling me all these stories, which is not necessary for this course. And, and, and so she would do this, and she would follow other gurus. And she said, I, I, I always could feel God is there, but I couldn't touch him. And then, then she said she went back to the place, city she was from, and she, she couldn't stand Christians, especially evangelical Christians. She thought they were kooky. And, and, and so she didn't even consider Jesus. She had a hunger for God, but she didn't consider that, that, that Christians or evangelical Christians that believed in Jesus had anything possibly to offer her. <laughs> she, she, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're a little bit weird, those people. And, and, uh, but she came back home and then she, she felt like a voice said to her, she walked, was going for a walk on a Sunday morning and she, and it was in August, it was summertime, a lot of people were on vacation, but uh, she felt the voice, she said, go, go into that building. She went in, there was a church. And she said, I can't remember a thing that the preacher said, but at the end he said, if you want to know God, come, come to the front. And she said, I went up there, I didn't know anything. And he just said, call on the name of Jesus. And she said, it was like that glass wall, it just shattered into a million pieces. Powerful testimony. But, but that, that's the idea in Hinduism. See, you do, you do different uh, exercises like that. Uh, you, you try to get close to God by these exercises, and, and, and mental and physical. And, and, and that, that's how Hinduism uh, works. And so what, how does that relate to the gospel? Well, you know, we have experience, like speaking in tongues, the gifts of the Spirit. They are gifts not dependent on, on mental exercises because they're a gift, but they are supernatural expressions through the body that God moves on your tongue. You speak in a language you never studied and it builds you up, it strengthens you. They, these things can make sense to a Hindu person while some Christians think it's, it, it's weird or strange. Well, before I, I, I just brought this book. If you want to study this, this is to me, one of the most fantastic books you could ever get. I, I'm gonna hold it up here. It's on the recommended reading. Christ in the Ancient Vedas. This, this man, Joseph Padinja Carrera, I can't even say his name. He gave it to me personally. I, I'm embarrassed I can't pronounce his name properly. It's a fantastic work. You can probably order it on Amazon. Uh, I don't know, J just, just Google it and find out, get that book. I think we may have some copies in our office. And it, it goes through the ancient Veda books and goes through one sacrifice after the other. What I said about Prajapati um, and, and Purusa Prajapati, well, that, that was just skimming the surface. This book gives you a real in-depth insight into Hinduism. Now. I said the, the, uh, the idea of Hinduism and of, uh, of Buddhism is uh, to go to nirvana. Nirvana is merely becoming one with cosmos. It's becoming one with the universe. It's not a, a place like heaven uh, that we think of heaven, but it is becoming one with, with, the, with God. We're going to give you some definitions here in a moment. In fact, I'm going to do it right now. Um, and these are definitions that apply both to Hinduism and Buddhism, though it's a, it's a slightly different. We're maybe talking about Eastern religions, so I'm including both of them. Um, so karma, your karma is a concept by which you receive benefits in the future 
or punishment in the future for things done in the past. You do good deeds in the past, then that causes good things to happen in the future. Vice versa, if you do bad deeds, it causes bad things in your future. So therefore, if somebody takes sick, if someone loses their mind, it can easily be interpreted, well, they must have done something bad. Or for example, it, it does lend itself to a, a very negative treatment of some humans. You know, in India, you have a caste system, officially uh, illegal, but very much still, in my opinion, and most people from India will tell you it's very much in effect still. And so you are born into a caste. There are higher caste and there are lower caste, and then there's no caste. And, and that is all dependent on your previous life. Therefore, you could argue that if someone is a beggar, you ought maybe not to help that beggar very much because after all, that beggar is just paying for his bad karma from a previous life. So actually, you may be violating the process of nature if you help that beggar too much. Maybe you could give him a little coin just to survive, but you wouldn't want to give that beggar a job because that would be violating who the beggar is. He, he was born that way, predetermined, because his karma was bad. Who knows what bad things he had done in his previous life. And if he now stays being a good beggar and being contented in his beggarly state, in the next life, he will be reincarnated, reborn into a something greater, something more prominent. So there are all kinds of effects, and these are very sensitive areas. I'm speaking very directly to you. I don't ex expect you to go and repeat what I just said to a Hindu person. They might feel embarrassed when that comes from a Westerner, but it, it, it's a fact, and you see it very much when you visit uh, places like India, that, that even though laws and things have polished it up. Of course, in India today, there's a very strong pro-Hindu movement. And so the current government, as I'm recording this in India, has, has taken a strong stand against Islam, but also against Christianity, making it harder uh, to, to operate. It's a very pro-Hindu uh, political situation in India today. And so that's the word karma. Now, in the Buddhist tradition, it's the same idea, but in Buddhism, it's more the intention. If you had a good intention, it's credited to you for an improvement of your karma, even if it didn't turn out so good, but it's more the intention. So in Hinduism, it might be a little bit more, uh, uh, you know, ritualistic. Uh, you, you, you do your offerings, you, do, you go to the temple, you do the sacrifice. Well, in Buddhism, it's more uh, moral and ethical action that has good intentions. You try to help someone that's credited to you. For example, in, in Buddhism, uh, you know, every act, the reason the monks can walk around in the Buddhist culture as they do every morning. If you're in a Buddhist country such as Myanmar, you will see the streets are filled with monks and nuns in their saffron robes, and they walk around and they collect food and money and whatever gifts they can from people's houses. You say, how can they get away with this? Can you imagine <laughs> in, in our culture, if someone comes to your door asking for a handout, you'd be offended. You say, well, you know, you've been here every morning, go somewhere else. But within that thinking is that people give that little gift, whatever it is, a piece of bread, to the monk, that improves their karma. They can also give it on behalf of a relative. And then that includes the relative's karma and their own karma, because they were so kind to think of the relative. And so it's a very works-oriented uh, situation. So, so that was one of the enlightenment is primarily a uh, Buddhist world. It has to do when you come to the realization of what life is all about, that life is really meaningless and all your desires are vain and you're ready for nirvana to become one with the, with the universe. And then I think I had one other word there in your, in your notes and I will get to it in a moment. Here it is. Um, uh, I had covered karma, reincarnation. Uh, just to, to, to explain that, that word reincarnation, it is rebirth. And within Buddhism, there can be six different realms. You can be reborn as an animal. You can be re reborn uh, in, in different realms. And it has a direct corresponding relationship to you, your previous life. And so those concepts are there. And then ultimately, when you reach the highest stage 
then you enter nirvana. And, and nirvana, therefore, that we call heaven, is you are delivered. And let me wipe the board here with, with you, and you're probably taking lots of notes, so I, you can just uh, get another notepad ready. To uh, uh, Nirvana is to become one. Nirvana is to be one with with God, except Buddhism officially doesn't even believe in God, but in Hinduism, one with, with God or one with, uh, shall we put as another option, nature or one with the universe. And, and, and so it's a state of you are with the oneness and it's, it's, it's a deliverance. They look at it as a deliverance from the painful cycle of rebirth. And so when you speak about in a Hindu culture, in a Buddhist culture, as a, as a gospel carrier, you may be familiar to, with the word being born again. You may say, how many want to be born again? Lift your hand, you know. <laughs> well, you got to be a little careful when you're speaking to Hindus and Buddhists about being born again, because they will think about reincarnation. Oh, I, I'm going to be reborn. Maybe I'll come back as a monkey. Maybe I'll come back as a mouse. Maybe I'll come back as a... A very intellectual professor in a university. I, uh, uh, this, so when you say being born again, uh, to you it may sound like a very positive term. Wouldn't people want to be born again, receive new life? But to someone from an Eastern pantheistic uh, Buddhist or Hindu background, uh, to be born again is a negative thing. They want, the whole purpose of life is to be delivered from the cycle of rebirth. And so uh, when I, uh, you know, when I, my first times there. I had studied this already, so I knew enough not to use such a word, or even the word eternal life. Think about how you use that word. Because in a certain way, a Buddhist or Hindu wouldn't want eternal life. They want to become part of nirvana. They want to be one with cosmos. And, and to keep living like they're living here on the earth, that doesn't seem like a desirable thing. So. So when I say it, when I give the invitation to receive Christ, or when I teach on this, I talk about this new life of conscious living with God. You can, you can receive eternal life, which is not pain. It is, it is a conscious reality together with God who loves you. So I find other ways to say the same thing. Would you like to receive this gift of the forgiveness of sin and you have a guarantee that you are forever linked with God in a conscious reality? Even when you die, you are in a conscious presence of God who loves you. And so I find ways to describe that. You, you see, you have to be conscious of your audience. It, 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 you can't just... And that, you know, some, some, I don't want to mention names because my point is not to embarrass anyone. But I've had some very famous preachers in America who you know their name and they see the great crowds that we have in our campaigns all over the world and say, oh, Peter, can I come with you? I'll help pay for it. Can I preach one night? And I said, no, you can't because I know they couldn't do it. They can't get out of their Christian lingo. They can't get out of their Christian, you know, they're not able to shift from the conference mode in America to, to standing in front of Buddhist. And so they would ruin my meeting. They, the people say, what's he talking about? So be conscious of your audience. That's all I'm teaching you with this. Let, let, let me say, I, I just allotted one class for this and I want to say something about Buddhism as well. Buddhism is the fourth largest religion in the world, practiced by five to 600 million people. All forms of Buddhism seek for enlightenment. I mean, that's the whole, the word Buddha means the enlightened one. And once you are enlightened, then you get to nirvana. You become one with the universe. And, and, and you have to go through cycles, endless, painful cycles of rebirth, except in Tibetan Buddhism. They have a, I'll get to that in a moment. But generally speaking, you know, when I, when I'm up with, the, when I'm with the monks in a pagoda somewhere in the world in a Buddhist temple, I say to them, you know, tell me about nirvana. Are you going to get to nirvana? Oh, they say, I'm not sure. I said, oh, the, look at all the people, hundreds here praying. 
do you think any of them are going to get to nirvana? And they say, probably not, probably not. It'll take many more rebirths. So there's no assurance. There's no like, yeah, I got life. I'm, you know, when I die, I'm going to live. It's not that assurance that we use to as Christians. You know, thank God, even though I'm dead, I'm going to live. I'm going to be with Christ. They don't have that. And, and I said to one, one I, I pressed the issue a little bit. I said, now, you have like 50 million Buddhists in this country. You think, how many in a year do you think would get to nirvana? of the ones who die, I suppose maybe, you know, half a million die every year or a million. How many of them? Oh, he said, I don't know, maybe one or two, maybe one or two. So it's a pretty uh, dim outlook, you know? And so uh, I'm back to the notes here. Buddha means the enlightened one and Siddhartha Gautama, who was the son of a king, uh, is, is the founder of Buddhism and he became the first Buddha. And he says, I awoke. I was awakened. Uh, and the hindrance to awakening, the hindrance and the cause of sin and everything is suffering. And, and, and Buddhism teaches that suffering is caused by desire. You suffer because you desire something you don't have. And once you can be free from desires, your sufferings will cease. So for example, if you are sick, have a disease and painful in your body, if you can get to a mental place where you don't desire for anything else. You don't desire to be healthy. You, don't, you, you cease to desire, then the suffering loses its grip on you. It sounds very strange to people who, who say that Jesus heals and God is a good God and God wants to help you. But, but this is their thinking. You need to be aware of it. Now, in Tibetan Buddhism, they think that you can have a, a fast track to nirvana in one lifetime. You can just get there. But it, it takes extraordinary uh, exercises. You know, you can study this. I, I, have, uh, I have a book here I recommend, The Buddhist World. Let's get a close-up of that. It's an, I really, this one I really urge you to get. The other books, uh, the, this one about Hinduism, that, that's for people who want to study deeply. This one, it should be in everyone's library. And it just gives you just short articles that talk about uh, Buddhism, introducing it, including Tibetan Buddhism, about Dalai Lama, about many things. But it lists all that, I think it's about 240 uh, people groups that practice Buddhism. And so I, I recommend that. And I brought it here to the set today so that I could, I could show it to you. Now, uh, Buddhism, I said, is considered by many to be official in atheistic religion. That doesn't teach a supreme creator, God. Because really God is in everyone, and so whatever is God is just a human energy, it's a human awareness. However, in practice, I have found Buddhism doesn't practice what they believe here. Officially, they might say there's no God, but in practice, I, I was uh, with one uh, very exalted uh, monk who had thousands of monks underneath him. And you know, I have a little problem with names. This was in Myanmar. It's hard for me as a Westerner to, to learn the names in these different countries. So I said to him, what's your name? I wanted to know his name. And he says, well, I have two names. One that my mother gave me and one that God gave me. I was thinking, well, you don't even believe in God. But, but see, in practice they do. And they have a lot of spirits and demons and ghosts and fearsome creatures. Like, like I was just in a Buddhist city and in several of the temples, they bow down to a python snake. I put it in our magazine. I put it in our letter to our partners. And somebody said to me, I got your letter with a big python snake and there's money on top of the snake and there's, there is this prayer request. And she said, I threw the letter. She said, I was so scared of the snake. So I said to her, did you pick it up? Because I want, she said, yeah, eventually I picked it up. She said, but I, I threw it at first. Well, at least I got her attention. See, that was just a picture taken in the city where we just had a festival where many thousands came to the Lord and they would bow down to this python. And, and they, are, they are thinking, I said, why, why this python? They say, they think this python is 125 years old and it's a reincarnation of a princess. So, they're, so, so these kind of beliefs, so they're very, very strange beliefs maybe it does, but, but it shows the people's hunger after God. And, and there was a steady stream by that python just bowing down, just, 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 just uh, 
worshiping. How, how does the gospel relate to this? Well, the gospel relates 100%. It, it relates on, from every angle. It, it is the power of God. Jesus, Paul, John, Peter ministered in a world like this, full of demons and spirit beings being cast out. You come into the Buddha's world and you can get underneath the intellectual veneer into where the people are at. They live in fear of demons and darkness. And you are a carrier of the light. You speak the name of Jesus Christ. Oh, thank God. Okay, I got to hurry, hurry. Uh, the three main branches of Buddhism. Theravada Buddhism means, Theravada means the doctrine of the elders. This form of Buddhism is practiced in Thailand, Myanmar, Laos, Cambodia, Sri Lanka, and among several minority groups in China. It is sometimes referred to as the lesser vehicle. Now, obviously, the people who practice Theravada Buddhism don't like the name the lesser vehicle because it sounds like they're lesser. But it simply means that the focus is on the smaller group, focuses on the individual. The individual, him or herself, are trying to earn merits to improve their karma to get a, a, a better life. Uh, so that's the focus of so the monks, nuns, all these people, and, and everybody is on this ladder climbing higher for the next rebirth so that you'll have a little bit better. You might go from a, from a snail to a squirrel to a, uh, to a monkey. To a, to a, you, you get higher. And uh, uh, that's Theravada Buddhism. It's very works-oriented. It's very much uh, the message of God's grace just, boom, hits like a bomb into that. Then you have Mahayana Buddhism, which means the greater vehicle is practiced in Japan, Korea, Vietnam, China, and in other communities in various parts of the world. The emphasis is on the community rather than the individual. Um, even though, of course, there's an individual obligation, but it's, it's, it's the community. And, and so that's why it's called the greater vehicle. The, the community, they are, they're Buddhist together. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's the community. Now, in, in Mahayana Buddhism, you had different hells and heavens and, and, and all kinds of descriptions of nirvana. And you also have these demonic spirit realm areas. And uh, uh, prayers are, are, are addressed to Buddha. And Theravada Buddhism, they don't pray so much to Buddha. In Mahayana Buddhism, they pray to Buddha almost always with a, with a ritual that the whole community is doing the ritual together at a certain time. Well, again, same as to Theravada Buddhism, the gospel relates to this. Then I mentioned something about Tibetan Buddhism. It's a form of Mahayana Buddhism, but for study purposes, we call it a third kind of Buddhism. There's a Zen, Zen Buddhism, but I'm not going into that. You can Google that or study that on your own. And, and in Tibetan Buddhism, you can get you know, to Nirvana in one step. And it's, it's uh, you know, I've, I've read articles about it. For example, someone might crawl on their bare hands and on their knees for hundreds of miles, hundreds of miles. It takes them years to get to a certain holy shrine or a temple. And you could see the, the buildup. You know, if you, if, you, if you crawl 12, 16 hours a day on your knees and hands, for years. Can you imagine how they look? But this is all to earn merits, to do some great physical act that you could reach nirvana. And parents dedicate their children. There's a great story in this uh, book here about a father and mother who dedicated their young uh, boy to become a monk. He became a monk at the age of six, and then later on he, he had an encounter with Jesus Christ. But these extraordinary physical steps are taken to, to get merits from God. And again, within uh, Tibetan Buddhism, they, they are really going to the, these fearsome, brutal spirit beings, real brutal, vengeful, um, grotesque looking spirit beings that have to be appeased. And, and the reason we single out Tibetan Buddhism is that when Buddhism came to Tibet, maybe about 600 years after Christ, uh, it was mixed with the traditional religion. So it took on another form. It's, it, to some would say it was not as pure Buddhism. Some say it's a more powerful form of Buddhism. People have different religions, but it mixed with the traditional religions. And again, my experience has been among Buddhists 
that they are wide open to the gospel. And, and this really saddens me because when we talk about taking the gospel to the world, many don't even talk about Buddhist. It's like the Buddhist world doesn't exist. We talk about, we go to Africa, we go to uh, reach Muslims, we can talk about it a little bit, but Buddhist, but Buddhists are wide open to the gospel. And, and Jesus comes as a bright light to them. How I've seen, I remember uh, Mio Sheet, the, uh, in the very first day that after years of military dictatorship, I was allowed back into the nation of Myanmar, Burma, and I, I preached that night, and, and, a, and a Muslim man who had been deaf for 37 years saw a vision of Jesus, and Jesus came and took out his hearing apparatus out of his ears. Never heard of Jesus. He thought I was giving out free medication. He thought when he saw our advertising something to do with health and well-being, you know, <laughs> he didn't pick up that we are going to pray in the name of Jesus. He came for whatever kind of little uh, thing bottle we had to offer, and uh, and 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 his ears were opened. And the next day he said, "I got to find some place where they believe in Jesus." So he had heard that in a church they're supposed to believe in Jesus because he picked that up from the night he was with us, and he went there and he worshipped Jesus. Beautiful. I mean. You know, when I was in Bali, among the Hindus there in Bali, we had Hindu priests receive Jesus. I remember a Hindu priest, very highly respected, who was lame, carried in on a bed. And, and when I prayed, he got up and walked. And we visited him the next day. And uh, he was walking and running there and, and, and praising God, giving praise to Jesus Christ. And actually, they wrote about it in the, in the newspapers in Bali. The main newspaper had it on the front page that this Hindu priest ha had received Jesus. But later on, we received a warning that said, well, you can pray for the Hindu priest, but if they get healed, don't tell anybody because the government doesn't like if you tell people that Hindu priests have been healed. It seems to be too challenging for the culture to accept that. And so what's happening in many places, people are receiving Christ. Maybe some of them come out in the open and they declare it. Others, that they have to grow in it a little bit. But I'm saying to you, the harvest is great. The labors are few. The Eastern religion world of Hinduism and Buddhism is there for the taking. Let's give them the gospel. I hope you've enjoyed tonight's teaching. Share it. Uh, on Facebook. Share it with friends so that others can hear uh, this message as well. We're honored that you've uh, joined us. This Sunday, uh, we're continuing our Sunday uh, experience, and so we invite you to uh, come out in person, 190 Railside Road. We're having great in-person services, and of course, we continue to make the services available online. Uh, of course, for World Impact Celebration Church, people tuned in around the world every month. In fact, last month, we had 88 countries tuned in at some point to our Sunday uh, service experience. And so we look forward to that continuing and you continuing to join us. And of course, we know there's people here in Toronto who just, for whatever reason, can't come out in person yet. And so uh, keep joining us online and, 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 and making that commitment. I know it's a, it can be a commitment to, 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 to join in, but I know that there's a, there's a strengthening, there's an equipping that happens when we make that commitment to be a part of a spiritual family. So I encourage you to continue to do that. And right now I invite you to be a part of the giving family. And more than invite you, and yes, it is an opportunity. It's an opportunity for each of us to have a, 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 a lasting, um, uh, a lasting benefit in the individual's lives for eternity. With Jesus mentioned that in reference to giving. He said, make it eternal friends through your, through your giving or through unrighteous mammon. And we can recognize that when we give, we're, we're making friends. People are receiving Christ, hearing the gospel, being liberated and set free for, uh, through our giving that enables the preaching of the gospel. This, this, this church, this broadcast tonight would not be made possible without uh, uh, the giving family. So thank you for that. And thank you for being a part of that. And then, of course, you know, Jesus said, as we give, he supplies back to us over and over and over again. I was talking to one of our members in our church this week and you know, he said, pray for me, Nathan, pray for my business, pray for some of the business dealings that I'm doing. And I know this brother and he's a, he's a, he's a giver. He, he, uh, he, he already gives generously, but he said, I, I'm believing to give so much more. And so, you know, that's the kind of heartbeat of this church family, people believing God to, 
to, to make money, make money in business, make money in other areas so they can keep giving more and more to the work of the gospel. That's Jesus' heartbeat so that people can receive the gospel. But, you know, people, for the preaching, for the giving to happen, he's got to put money into your hands. And so we believe that he gives seed to the sower. And so we're believing God for your life. I know individuals in our church believing God for jobs and businesses. And I know God's heart and Jesus' heart is that you that prosper so that you can continue to finance the work of the gospel. So we'll pray for you in a moment's time, but this is our time in our, in our service when we give an opportunity to give and to be participants in that. And so you can see the information that's on the screen. I encourage you this evening to, yeah, there's two different screens, one for Toronto Celebration Church, how you can give if you're here in Toronto. And then, of course, if you're other parts of the world, you can give the, the, the information that's on the screen for you right now. Uh, but, but give in faith, give in faith, believing that people are receiving Christ through your giving and receiving the liberation of the gospel through your giving. But then also give in faith that, that more and more seed will be put into your hands so that you can continue to be a greater financer of the, of the work of the gospel. Father, I thank you for every giver tonight. I thank you that you've given them faith to see that the fruit of their giving. And I thank you for great fruit through this church and ministry, Father. Bless the works of their hands. Bless individuals with jobs and, and opportunity and favor. In the name of Jesus, we thank you. Amen. Well, before I know you keep responding and keep giving even after we sign off the air. I just want to take this opportunity as well before we sign off. And we do this every uh, uh, Wednesday evening through Power Hour. And you might be watching this after Wednesday because it's, uh, it's available anytime on Facebook or YouTube. But, 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 but the prayer still has power and still works when we pray in the name of Jesus. And we like to pray and agree together with you in faith. You know, every Monday night we have Miracle Monday and we, we, we list the prayer requests one by one by one that have been sent in. And we don't do that Wednesday night, but, but, but continue in the same spirit of lifting up the, the, the needs of, the, of this church family. And we consider you part of the family because you, you continue to join in and, become, and continue to commit yourself to this uh, spiritual family, whether in person or, or online. And so well, let's lift up your prayer request now. Father, I thank you right now. I, I recall Monday night how many individuals were be believing you for health and healing in their bodies and we recognize you Lord as the Lord who heals not the Lord who gives sickness but the Lord who heals so father I thank you for health being uh, in individuals bodies now in the name of Jesus Lord we lift up your name that name above every other name and and I thank you Jesus that you give healing and health I thank you for restoring and, 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 and fulfilling your promise that the number of our days you would fulfill. And Lord, we, we've seen you do it in the past. We've seen you heal individuals even this week, how people have, you know, were praying to, for, for, for restoration in their body who had gone through surgery. And I thank you, you brought them through. Father, I think of the brother on dialysis in our church. I thank you for healing him and that by your stripes he is healed, Father. I thank you for these wonderful promises in your word, Father. I thank you for the lady I spoke to on Sunday who, who's believing you for a growth in her, in her body to be healed. We speak healing now in the name of Jesus. Father, we rejoice in you. We thank you for meeting the financial needs of your people, Father. I thank you for a brother in our church just last week, been believing for a job. He got a job, Father. And I thank you that you you're no respecter of person, but you keep supplying for the needs of every person who's asking you now in the name of Jesus. You, are, you said you'd supply all our needs according to your riches and glory. So I thank you that you do that now uh, in the name of Jesus, Father. We thank you for that. We thank you how you've been meeting needs. You've been helping people, bringing joy and peace in their hearts, Father. We speak that now in Jesus' mighty name. And everyone said... Amen. Well, we, we appreciate you tuning in tonight. We love to hear from you. So keep sending in comments, sending in prayer requests. Uh, we'll keep joining in faith with you. And until we meet again, we hope to see you again this Sunday morning. Uh, excuse me. We'll have a great time together. So God bless you and have a great night. Bye-bye.